In the early 1910s, Carl Jung had been plagued for days and days by a voice in his head. He felt like he was going insane. This voice wasn't even his own. It was the voice of a woman that he knew in his professional life. It'll all come to pass. You must accept it. She was a Dutch psychologist who always argued with him that repairing people's minds was not a science. This is art, my dear. And so Jung sat down and wrestled with this experience, night after night. He tried to use the knowledge of psychoanalysis to figure out what was wrong. Perhaps my unconscious is forming a personality that isn't me, but is insisting on coming through into expression. This fits perfectly with my scientific training. No, 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 stop! Stop insulting me! It's just a voice in my head. It's not unusual. Socrates had a voice in his head. Aquinas had a voice in his head. Divine reasons. This is no different. They could speak with theirs. They, they could have a dialogue. Okay, okay. Who are you, and why have you been bothering me the past few nights? What do you mean, bothering? You've spent years well, in the recesses I? of your mind, pondering and planning to write a great work, which will impress them. What, what, what is happening? You want them to revere you like they revere Nietzsche and Goethe. You want to do this with your science. science. You want to take slow, safe steps and follow the respected way. Yet, I could help you do it if you only let me in. But you treat me as an object you can study from a safe distance. As if you are terrified of me. But I am the source of revelation. Wait, wait, one second. Who are you? <laughs> Carl. I am your soul, and you've been very disrespectful. Wait, wait, you, you have to be joking with me, this is crazy. What? Ask yourself if you think I am joking. You already understand enough. The knowledge is already within you. You just need to transform it into life. You need to live the new way. I thought she released me. I was finally gifted a calm night's sleep, but as I drifted off into rest, I was informed by the deepest spirit within me that the next night I would begin my descent into the underworld. So a fascinating phenomenon from the past is the appearance of this magical angel on your shoulder, this guardian angel, or as the poets often call her, the muse. This feminine force that fills you full of inspiration. Here in Ireland we have a, a, a saint called Saint Bridget and she was considered the, the, the saint of inspiration. She actually comes from pagan times. She was the goddess Bridget who all the Irish poets who used to speak about the gods used to speak as the, the, the force that would appear to them. As uh, Homer said at the start of the, of the Iliad, sing O sacred muse of the rage of Achilles. There was something about this outside force who would come to these very, very special men and, and, and fill them full of energy and they would become vessels for her will. Now, Jung went through an experience much like this. You read through the Red Book and one of the star characters is this anima of his. Now, I want to talk to you today about a lot of different things and I'm going to do a heretical thing. I'm going to pull the skirt up on this magical experience Jung had and talk a little bit about maybe science underneath it and what some of this stuff might mean. Um, but all for a greater good, all so we can get a deeper grip of the understanding is what is going on. Now of course you've heard me say a thousand times before about the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere but I do want to present this case and, and give you even more context and evidence to show you that there's definitely something to this, something we must inspect and itch our chin with an awful lot more. So let's take a look. Now the fascinating thing about the anima in Jung's red book is that it's a, it's a girl, it's a chick, it's a lady. 
it's, it's you know how are you doing babe what's up yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, oh, I'm schizophrenic now am I nice <laughs> all right good to know well I'm glad you're with me anyway that type of thing and um and this 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 polarity this gendering and um, actually gives us this, the secret in order to understand this this gives us the way that we can see into this this experience this phenomenon you see it's about the principle of duality you read the Kabbalion you read one of those crazy texts and they, they talk about like the principles of the world and one of them is the principle of duality the idea that there's there's two forces in the world the world is not a unipolar place you know the, the world has got a lot going on and there's definitely more than one thing going on at any one time now this principle can be kind of hard for people to wrap the noggin around you know it's it's jargon at the, at the end of the day so i want to give you an illustration of what the, what this might be you might come to me steph and say steph you're irish and i'll be like yeah i'm irish and it's like well teach me how to box and i'm like all right yeah like put your hands up like this and go like here i'll fight you your father <laughs> do that but of course if you came to me and said that and i said oh no problem i'll show you how to box so what you got to do is you got to get your two hands and you have to tie them together and you have to yeah, punch people. And you'd say, I know Steph. Steph, I'm not I'm not too sure about that now. That doesn't seem like it makes that much sense to me. Like if I tie them together, I'll look like a bit of an idiot, to be honest. Like I'm not sure I'll be really knocking anyone out. And I'd be like, what are you on about, right? So you have two hands. And if you punch someone with the hands, they'll be strong. So if you tie the two of them together, you'll be twice as strong. You'll be a beast. You'll have a super hand. And you'll be able to just walk around and like crack people full force in the face. And now that's very, very logical when you think about it. It's like, you know, it's like two is better than one. It's like more is, is better, that type of thing. But of course, it's not practical. It's not actually what reality rewards. It seems that reality likes the idea of you taking two smaller forces, which is two little hands, but actually using them in a dynamic way, giving them separate roles, but aiming towards the same goal. Okay, if you ever learn on the box, the first thing they'll teach you is that, well, you're going to have two different hands. The first front hand is going to be your jab hand. Clack, 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 clack. That's what it sounds like, yeah. <laughs> and the idea there is that you're, you're pissing someone off. You're annoying them by popping them in the jaw quite a lot. But then you'll have this other hand, and this other hand does a different job. It does the backhand job. This is the power hand. So these two things are not doing the same thing at all. And so you're supposed to annoy the person with the front hand and then you have a dynamic game going on. And then just when the, the person's like, can I get like, ah, get that out of my face, you're bang straight down the pipe and they're unconscious. And that is exactly what you're looking for. Power from one and then practicality from the other. A dual pair of forces. Now, this is a very, very important thing to understand because this is more effective. You don't see any fighters running around doing the, the Steph punch. You don't see that happen at all because it doesn't work. Because if you went out into the world and you went out into the boxing ring where there's real consequences, a lot like the jungle in nature, you went out and you tried to use one hand in the boxing ring, you'd get knocked unconscious. So all the people who win in boxing are the people who use dynamic uses of their hands. They operate under the principle of duality. Now... Extend this very same concept to your noggin, to your brain. If I uh, dual punched you with my magic move and your, your brain just splattered open and cracked open and I got me and me boys walked up and we started to inspect my work, I would see that your brain is actually split into two chunks. And so it's the same principle. It's like, oh, obviously the boxing ring of life, the jungle, the forest, nature. Um, life was figuring out, or oh, how do I win in nature? What do I do? And so it decided, oh, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to split the brain in half and give it like, like two fists. I'm going to give it two forces. I'm going to give it two things going on at the same time. And you're kind of thinking about it. It's like, all right, well, why did you do that? Like, if you think about it, the same kind of thinking here. Why didn't, and Ian McGilchrist talks about this. Why didn't you just get the, the head, which has all that space in it? And why don't you be the most efficient you can with that space by turning it into this supercomputer? Where you take this big head and you connect everything totally together. So it's like this giant AI Google supercomputer machine that can process everything like a giant super punch. That, that would be the logical thing. Like, if I was designing a brain, that's what I would do. And I'd assume you do the same. But of course, what life has chosen to do, what seems to work in nature, and most animals have this as well, is that it decided actually to, 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 to do something really inefficient. It cuts right down the middle of the brain and it splits it into two chunks, these two little smaller computers. So it, it loses computational power and it gives you two little smaller computers and it kind of separates them and it gets them to act uh, almost against each other um, on the world. Now, this is a pretty cool observation by Mr. Ian. He notices, he's like studying the hardware, he's studying the laptop, you know, and he's sort of saying, you know, this laptop is split into two processors and they both can do stuff. 
And it's sort of like, all right, cheers, great, Ian, thank you very much. But then the next sort of procedural question, because we're out here trying to live, man, the next procedural question for us is, well, okay, cool, all right, all right we know maybe maybe this is what the hardware does, we'll give you that, but what do we do with it? What's the function? What's the purpose and role of these two blobs, this, this sort of weird organization of the hardware that nature has chosen? It's the same way as if, you know, you got in a highly trained expert who comes in and um, to teach you how to box, and he comes in and he like walks around, he looks looks you up and down and he says you have two hands there don't you and you're like yeah 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 am i paying you this much to tell me this it's like yeah like obviously we can see the hardware but then the question is well what do what do these two hands do like we, what what is preferable preferable for the roles of these two hands is, is that front hand better suited to jabbing is that what it is why is that is there like a, a reason behind that how should i conceptualize that practically so when i'm out in in the fight i can just think jab 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 i don't want to be think this is my procedural right hand that i use you want to kind of be able to make it eloquent and simple, elegant and simple. And um, so you, you, you're trying to figure out procedural roles that help us understand what these forces do, what these powers do, what these separate pieces of hardware can do. And so we can conceptualize it easy. Think perhaps what was going on with psychology. You had Freud and Jung and whatnot, and they're trying to figure out maybe the ego and the unconscious as these, these, um, dresses they put over these these pieces of hardware that they, they didn't really understand back then. And and maybe this is what's sort of going on here. Ian, of course, gives it a shot. And we're going to talk about all this, and we're going to see how maybe the anima fits into the schema. But nonetheless, what I'm going to do um, first is actually show you Jordan Peterson struggling with this precise question. We have two hemispheres, left and the right, and no one exactly knows why. And we know that they house quasi-independent consciousnesses, because if you divide the corpus callosum, that that unites them, which was done to, in, in cases of intractable epilepsy, for example, that each hemisphere is capable of developing its own consciousness to some degree, the right generally nonverbal and the left verbal. And so there has been this idea that the left is a verbal hemisphere and the right is a nonverbal hemisphere. But that can't be right because, of course, animals don't talk and they have a bifurcated hemisphere. So if it's right, it's not causally right. right? Now, Goldberg hypothesized instead that the hemispheres were, were specialized for routinization and non-routinization, or for novelty and familiarity, or for chaos and order. And so that's pretty damn cool. When I ran across that, I also thought about that as a, as a signal of, of, what would you call it, multi-method, multi-trait construct validation, because I'd never thought of the hemispheres as operating that way, and Goldberg came up with this in a, in a historical pathway that was entirely independent from any mythologically inspired thinking, completely independent. In fact, it was motivated more by materialist Russian neuropsychology, which was materialist for political reasons and, and also for scientific reasons. But the idea is that we have one hemisphere that reacts very rapidly to things we don't know, and it's more imaginative and diffuse, and, it, and it's associated more with negative emotion, because negative emotion is what you should feel immediately when you encounter something you don't understand. Because it's a form of thinking, right? Negative emotion, it's like, I'm somewhere where things aren't what they should be. The right hemisphere does that, generates images very rapidly to help you figure out what might be there, and then the left hemisphere takes that and develops it into something that's more articulated and and algorithmic and fully understood. And so then there's this dynamic balance between the right and the left hemisphere where the left tries to impose order on the world. That's Ramachandran, who's a neurologist in, in California, a very famous neuro, 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 uh, neurologist, who also developed a theory like Goldberg's, who said that the left hemisphere imposes routinized order on the world and the right hemisphere generates novelty and, and uh, and re reacts to novelty and generates novel hypotheses. And he thought, and there is some good evidence for this, that's what hap what's happening during the dream is that information has moved from the right hemisphere to the left hemisphere in small doses, basically, so that the novel revelations of the right hemisphere don't demolish the algorithmic structures that the left hemisphere has so carefully put together. So. And I like that theory, too, because it also does help justify the hypothesis that I've been laying out for you, which is that, you know, there's part of us that extends ourselves out into the world and tries to understand what we don't know, and that that part extends itself out with behavior and also with emotion and also with image, and then maybe with poetry, and then maybe with storytelling, and then 
as that develops, then we develop more and more articulated representations of that emergent knowledge. And so you can map that quite nicely onto the neurologists and the neuropsychologists' presumption about what constitutes the, the reason for the hemispheric differentiation. But the other thing that's so cool about the hemispheric differentiation argument, as far as I'm concerned, and this is really, this is worth thinking about, man, because it's a real, it's a real, there's a word that Ned, Ned Flanders uses for that. Noggin scratcher? I think it's something like that. <laughs> Anyways, you know, we do make the assumption that what it is that we are biologically e adapted to is reality, right? It's actually an axiomatic definition if you're a Darwinian because nature is what selects. By definition, that's what nature is. It's what selects. And if the nature that selects has forced upon you a dual hemispheric structure because half of you has to deal with chaos and half, to, half of you has to deal with order, then you can make a pretty damn strong inferential case that the world is made out of chaos and order. And that's really something to, that's really something to think about, man, you know? So you can think about that for a while if you want. So this is not too bad. It's clear that the heavy hitters are really chewing and pondering about this, but I don't think we're quite there. There's, what I want you to start to see is that there's a problem, a difference between what we could say the hardware and the user interface, the way that we represent that hardware to ourselves so we can use it. There's one thing to know, okay, you should use your, both your hands dynamically and differently and between knowing in the moment, jab, 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 those type of things, that very simple, easy to use way of thinking about it. So this is what we're trying to move towards. And of course, having a good understanding of the hardware is great, but you also need to have a good software, a good user interface that you can present yourself. A lot of people are going to get mad at me for making the mind sound like a computer. It's a metaphor for the sake of helping us think about this. Please calm down. Now, anyway, so the, the problem with what we've got so far is that you're not going to walk around and be like, oh, that's my chaos brain. Oh, that's my chaos brain that's showing up. It doesn't feel quite right. Oh, there's my order brain. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel quite right. You know, it's not quite there yet, I don't think. It doesn't explain to us all of history. Like things that really, really land give us a much bigger picture. They, they, they allow us to look into the past and really see what's going on there with a lot more detail. Now, Maybe what we need to do is we actually need to get more specific about what this hardware does. We need to dive into it a little bit more so we can kind of see less so about the sort of theories and more so about the actual function. Now, some of the divisions between these two, these two powers, these two forces, these two laptops, whatever, these two processors, whatever way you want to think about it, the two jelly blobs in the mind, the two astral projection forces, whatever you want to think about it, they do have very specific and separate functions. And the way that you can think about this is when you're going to do something. So imagine you're walking in a field and you see right up ahead of you a awesome tree and you think to yourself you say i am going to climb up that tree and i'm going to return to monkey in that tree i'm going to go absolutely nuts and have a ball of a time it's going to be awesome and so what's sort of going on there is you you think you you formulate you postulate to yourself a mission a vision a goal a purpose okay and then what it looks like is that the way that you get motivated in order to go do that thing is that you need a lot of dopamine. The way that we sort of do anything, dopamine is like our, our motivation buzz, it's where we get our buzz from, is we, we, we look at a goal and then we fill ourselves full of hype until we get the goal and then we, we kind of get a bit depressed, it's like, oh, the relief, and then you're like, all right, next goal, hype, 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 the hype cycle. You've probably heard about that before. No, the left hemisphere is full of these dopin dopaminergic pathways because it's precisely geared towards this. It's our hype man. It's our bro who gets us to go do stuff. Now, this is obviously very, very important. It's, it's very, very good at step-by-step -step planning. It's very, very good at going to, to do stuff. And you've probably heard me talk about this on the channel many times before. Now, there's a phenomenon that you might recognize known as the corner of your eye. Oh, I saw that out of the corner of my eye. Now, this is where the right hemisphere operates from. There's actually this interesting thing where it the text all things in our peripherals. This is why I think Jordan and the people he was listening to um, call it the chaos brain, if you will, because it actually watches for things it does not know. And then as they vaguely begin to come in into your, your realm, your, your radar, you could say, um, it starts to throw really quick images onto it to try to figure out what is that? What is that? What's happening there? Attention, attention. What is that? What is that? What is that? And then as it comes into clarity, you know, back into your, your, your ordered understanding where you can kind of set a mission with it, that's sort of, you know, the left hemisphere can then set a plan up and therefore it's back in the, the sort of order brain, if you will. 
And so the right hemisphere actually has this interesting habit of sort of sitting on your shoulder and vigilantly, like a guardian, like a watchdog, quietly, and oftentimes it's actually out of the way. It's You could even say not necessarily conscious. It's out of the way. It's letting the left hemisphere run about and go do its thing and focus on returning the monkey. And it's just sitting there. And it's kind of analyzing the order, the the the, the peripherals. It's kind of, you know, sending out the radar beeps, but there's nothing coming up. So there's no need to worry. So why, why bother the left hemisphere? I don't want to make him feel like he's psychotic to just to, right now. No. But then say, for example, a bear shows up. And then what will happen is the right brain will spot that. It'll spot the archetype of the predator. You can think about it that way. It sees sharp teeth and like bear-like features. It's like, oh, see something. Now, what is the um, right hemisphere wired with a lot more? It's wired with a lot of noradrenaline. The word adrenaline. Look for that and that. What is that? That's uh, kind of like a spike, a flash of sort of fear or, or intensity and, and that type of thing. And um, often what they call the, the the negative emotion flash, if you will. But it's it's more just like a, you can think of it like the dart of fear. The dart of panic so you've had that experience where you're kind of walking around and you're and doing whatever and then you spot some little detail out of the corner of your eye and then suddenly your focus goes you get this big shock of fear and you go what the hell is that that type of feeling that would be your right hemisphere coming online and sort of saying bro what is that is that a fucking bear man is that the archetype of the dragon bear the dragon of chaos what is that watch out go over there and it's almost like it grabs the left hemisphere, so it's kind of quiet, but then it grabs the left hemisphere, it gl- grabs the, the, the planner, dude, and it, it actually pulls it away entirely from, from the plan and says, forget about returning the monkey, we're about to get eaten by a bear, and it says, look over there. And then as it sort of realizes, oh, okay, that's a bear, and it, 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 it lets the left hemisphere go back online, the left hemisphere can then make a plan to get the hell out of there, get the hell out of there, or something like that. And the left hemisphere is like, oh, my God, and then dopamine or whatever it does is like, go, leave, leave, quick, get out of there. Now, this is actually quite interesting because it is describing to us that dynamic set of forces, exactly what you would imagine. You would imagine that these two forces would do two different jobs and it would have to be practical for when you're trying to survive. So you're, you're out there, you're trying to return to monkey. And of course, you have these two, two punches and these punches are represented on like it's consciousness, it's attention. One of them is actually a sort of vaguely unconscious, vigilant watchdog who only steps in when it deems it necessary to course correct maybe you or the ego or the left hemisphere whatever it is and the left hemisphere is all about hype and really getting caught up in what it's doing and get really specific and detailed okay now this this is genuinely how these functions appear and how these two operant pieces of hardware work now there's another very very interesting dynamic here because of course um the in order for this to work you're kind of noticing this idea of one of them turns off while the other turns on so while the left hemisphere is going to monkey the right hemisphere is kind of like out of the way but then when the right hemisphere decides, okay, there's a bear, I need to alert this fucking idiot over here. <laughs> like, listen, and it switches on and it wakes it up and it pulls it and then it actually probably maybe goes quiet again and lets the left hemisphere run and do its thing. Now that's quite interesting because if you think about boxing, how does boxing work? You don't punch the two hands together like a plonker because that doesn't make sense. What you do is you punch with your jab and your other hand stays back here. And that's the correct way to punch. You don't punch together, you punch with the jab. So the other hand is inhibited while the other hand goes forward. And then when this hand comes back, you set that one off. So it's inhibition. It's like a dynamic play. You know, you're doing it dynamically. And it's actually quite a hard thing to synchronize because when you want to learn to box, you want to learn how to do that very, very snappy and quick. How to get them on and off, on and off in a perfect synchronicity, almost like a dance and whatnot. Now, when we look at the link between the two brains known as the corpus callosum, what we see is we actually notice that one of its main roles is inhibition. One of its main roles is to turn off the other hemisphere. They, they often, it's, it's a complicated thing, but one, one of these big deals is that, you know, when the left hemisphere is on, it will bully the right brain out of the way. And the right brain can only really un- interrupt that, or it seems like the right brain only really wants to interrupt that when something very, very bad is about to happen, when it gets a huge dose of noradrenaline. And, and there's this sort of inhibition thing. So it's like, the, you know, the right hemisphere can kind of say, shut up, my turn now. And the left hemisphere can say the same. They've noticed this when they cut the brain in half and they cut that corpus callosum. The two hands will often fight. You pick up a pair of pants you want to wear and hands will slap it out and pick up another pair of pants. These two consciousnesses, these two forces, these two things inside your head, they're actually not on the same agreement level and they think differently about things and they have different decisions and whatnot. And that's absolutely nuts when you think about it. Now, at this point, we have fairly accurately and copiously 
scientifically observed these two big lumps, these magic jelly pieces of hardware that do amazing things. We actually have a really detailed understanding of what they do, the functions that they have. We see all this crazy stuff about how they, like, they're sort of like two different forces, but it's still not quite there. It still just doesn't click. It doesn't fly. I don't think it'd be appropriate or right for the world to suddenly adopt this language and walk around and be like, that's my left hemisphere. That's my right hemisphere. That just doesn't seem smooth. It seems a little bit dorky. It seems a little bit neurotic and stuck in the head. Um, so, so how do we understand where to go next? What's going wrong? Well, the place I would take you is to the idea of the computer. Now, the mind is not a computer. It's magic jelly, definitely not sort of like electricity and all that type of stuff. But let's just, for the sake of the argument, make things a bit simple. And look at the problem that a lot of people had back in the day with hardware and computer computers. Because, of course, computers are amazing things and they can do amazing things, but they're machines and they have like very, very specific pieces of hardware. And back in the day when you used to want to use a computer, you had that black screen with all the zeros and ones in it. And a specialist would detail, like study in detail all the little pieces of hardware and learn how to talk to the computer in order to get the computer to do specific things and use certain parts of the hardware and whatnot. And that's all great, but it was never going to catch on. It was never going to do become a sort of thing, if you will. It was never going to become a big deal. And, and this is important because you want people to be able to use the computer to use their specific skills outside of, of just computational stuff. You, you want to give it to artists, you know, like give some musician a computer and show him how to use it. And you get things like Ableton, you get higher quality music. You don't want him to be have to learn how to use a computer. You want to give him something elegant and easy, which is what we call an interface. Now, the personal computer and people like Steve Jobs and Apple and whatnot, their great innovation was actually obsession on this point. Their whole idea was, okay, we're going to create the most elegant and simple user interface we possibly can so people can really use this black screen with zeros and ones. And they, what they actually do is they create something that's fake. They create a sort of, you know, magical delusion, a magical cloud, a, a second layer, a, a sort of colorful picture that's very, very easy for us, our little chimp brains in order to interact with. So instead of having the complex code and all that, you don't, you don't see any of that stuff. Instead, what you see is a nice blue screensaver or back, back picture, uh, background picture. And then you have all these little lovely clickable applications on your desktop. And you go in and you just, just click one button and then you go into the computer and you click that button and then you click that button. And it does all the things you want to do. And this infra interface has been specially designed for you in order for you to be able to interact with the computer and use the hard hardware, but you don't even know how it works. Now, this is actually really, really important because this is this precise same problem we're having here. We have the hardware. We actually understand it quite well. We even know stuff like, you know, the hemispheres and all this, but the kind of final step or the big step or a really, really important part nonetheless is really getting that interface question down and asking ourselves, what the hell is an interface in the realm of the mind, in the realm of psychology? This feels a bit too confusing. Confusing. Surely us, as the most advanced society of all time, surely we have one of the best inf interfaces that has ever existed in history. Look how technologically genius are we are. We've, we've got all this stuff on lock. And you'd be surprised to find out that that's actually the opposite case. You see, just because we've discovered the hardware now and we're really starting to get to know the hardware now doesn't mean that it, it, it only turned on. It's only going to start turning on now. The only logical thing that we can assume is that it's always been there and it's always been working in the background. We've just not really understood it. The same way as when you use your interface, your little uh, iPhone screen, and one day you ask yourself, how the fuck does this thing work? It, it's not like all of a sudden it just... It started there. It's always been working. You just didn't understand it. And the brain and the mind is much, much the same here. So we'd have to ask ourselves some very, very difficult questions here. Very, very challenging questions. Um, we're only after really figuring out a lot of this stuff recently. But obviously, these this, this dynamic of, how can I say, two forces inside the mind, it, it must have been here all along. And we also then have to inspect our current user interface, our our vision of psychology, our way that we, we, we use the word, we make sense of the mind and, and the world and whatnot. We have to look at that and sort of ask, well, how does that treat 
these phenomena that the hardware is suggesting. And you can kind of ask yourself that question. How do we treat the idea of other forces appearing in the mind? And of course, we consider that a mental illness. And fair enough, it's a very, very crazy thing when it does happen. It's a difficult experience. But the hardware suggests that that stuff is not out of the realm of possibility, that that could be a sort of normal enough function, all right? And we're going to talk about that more. But, but think about this little idea, the idea of psychosis or schizophrenia. These aren't these aren't old ideas. They're only about 150 to 200 years old. Like before that, there wasn't really this concept. And it actually looks like we've got like a new interface, if you will. And, and we're not even sure if it's the best interface because the, the right now we've got this massive mental health crisis. Everybody's got some type of diagnosis and problem. And it's not really doing us that much credit. It's not suggesting to us that we're really using the hardware that well. And in fact, when these weird phenomena show up, which we might call psychosis or schizophrenia, hallucinations, you know, things appearing in the mind that are not in the conscious ego's control, we actually tend to look at them as problems with the hardware. OK, and now that's an interesting thing. We sort of say, oh, your hardware is broken. Oh, you're, you're hearing stuff. Your, your mind is broken. Oh, you're depressed. Your mind is broken. You know, there's pretty decent evidence to suggest that depression is linked to higher activation in the right hemisphere. There's there's strange little factoids like this. And you, you don't really know what to make of that stuff, especially because we don't have an interface to understand this. And so in order for us to get a bigger picture on this, we kind of have to do a dangerous thing. We have to try plug ourselves out of our modern view and we have to try to see the big picture. And we actually have to continue with this first principle. This hardware must have been there in the past as well. And these people in the past, they must have been like iPhone users. They, they can use their brain very, very well. And there's a very lovely, elegant interface over it. But they don't really know the hardware, but they don't need to either. OK, and that elegant interface that they used worked perfectly fine, maybe even better than ours for the sake of mental health, because they had a sort of easy way or better way of dealing with these radically extreme problems like psychosis and mental illnesses of, of many, many sorts. And to give you an example of what this might be, you could probably call it religion. Now, I know that's quite controversial and I'm not trying to be reductive here. I'm trying to be reductive for the sake of the argument. So let's just follow along with that. But when you look back into religion, you have to assume that, all right, the religious interface is almost like a story or a worldview or a vision or a user interface that we paint over our psychology in the world. It's, it's a sort of unified thing. It's a very, very functional way of using the mind, you know? And what you start to notice is that there's a lot of phenomenon that begin to hint towards this idea, especially in the idea of like magic spirits and whatnot. Because an outside force appearing to you now is a kind of scary thing, of course. It's like, oh my God, I'm going insane. And you talk to a lot of people going through psychosis and it often, often has very religious themes, which is kind of eerie in and of itself. But you look into the past and you look at things that were perfectly normal and, and easier for people to integrate were things like, for example, the Holy Spirit coming to talk to me or a demon appearing in my mind, a demon appearing to me, appearing to me. Do you know that type of idea? Like it's appearing in your phenomenological reality like a spirit. It's not like walking into your room. It's a shoo, it's appearing in your like dimension or something like that. Now, that's a very, very, very strange and eerie way of thinking, but it's, it's how these people thought. And they treated it as a extremely real thing that can happen, whereas we see it as ridiculous and superstitious. OK, and um, but these people made it through harder times than us. So there must have been something right about it. You look back at Homer and he talks about the idea of the muse, the sacred muse who sings to me about the rage of Achilles. It's like, what are you on about, Homer? You, you're the dude who makes the books, you know, you just, just write, just shut up talking about fucking women, like, and just write, just, just write. But instead, no, he sees it as so important for his masterwork that he has to ask some outside force to come and help him. A feminine outside force, maybe that sits in his shoulder. In the Iliad itself, you have this moment where Achilles, the angry egotistical dopamine return to monkey left brain the 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 achilles wants to fight agamemnon because agamemnon has insulted him and right at the moment where he wants to pull out a sword and do it a a feminine spirit reaches down and grabs his hair and pulls him back and says hold on wait for the future don't do this stop for a second and this is like the guardian the gu the guiding force of some sort 
And then, of course, you see you see this all over the place in history. The more you look, as I said, you see stuff like the muses and whatnot and guardian angels and all these type of things. And it's very reductive to put it all down to, like, the right hemisphere. I'm not suggesting that at all. But it's it starts to fit in an uncomfortable way. Now, we have a very, very interesting question when it comes to Jung. Because Jung's anima fits this model and makes us scratch the noggin to wonder what's going on. And of course, Jung was at a very precarious point in history because he was right in the middle of that period where our interface had changed to the dead rationalistic way of seeing things. And what was the theme of the Red Book in that he meets this anima and this unconscious and he is scared because he believes he's going psychotic. The thing that is happening to him is the great problem of the interface my hardware is broken there's something wrong with me my i'm 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 damaged i'm dangerous and all this and there's a possibility that he was rediscovering something that people knew quite intuitively in their interfaces in the past now the psychology movement appeared at a very very important period in history because it was right as this old interface was completely disintegrating which Nietzsche called the death of God it was completely falling apart and people couldn't interact with their minds anymore there was kind of craziness going on people couldn't take Christianity serious they're very very much struggling with this now of course Psychology becomes more interesting when you start to look at the archetypes that appear in it. In the Christian church, in the Catholic church, you would go into confession, you would sit down, you would let all this stuff off your chest, and a priest, a learned elder, would sit down and hear all the stuff you're saying, and then they'd offer you some reorganizations of your mind, some magic jargon that would correct your mind for you, and that would um, allow you to get all that stuff out of you, get the demons out, cast the demons out, and then get this correct stuff that puts you in that's good energy, and then you go off in your merry way and you feel better because you, you, you got it out of you and you got corrected. Now that's so similar to the psychoanalytic couch where you lie down, you literally let stuff out of you, 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 you know, radically honestly confess what is going on and then the, the analyst sits down and they, they try to rearrange and, and correct and add the correct jargon and put the, the correct spell and name the demons that are living inside you and treat you the magic spells in order to fix that. It's a very, very similar, similar pattern which is quite, quite fascinating. But of course it does make sense because with the struggle that these gentlemen like Freud and Jung were having is that, as I said, this new interface was, there was a need for a new interface. They, everybody instinctively knows that we need an interface to interact with our minds more than we need um, stuff like neuroscience and hardware and whatnot. Um, but of course, these guys didn't have neuroscience and hardware. They're almost like in a bridge point. We have all the, the hardware understood now, um, but they didn't. They were sort of in the middle. They had to do something. And so they began to try to figure out a logic of the soul. Psychology is soul logic, okay? And what sort of comes up from this is the vision of what is happening in the mind and what are the forces active in the mind now it, like again we've already talked about this plenty you know you have these two dynamic forces coming from the hardware but, but these guys didn't know that okay and actually the, the the era of their day was that we've got this one rational perspective you can think about the idea of genius how do you create something genius you know you you sit down and you think about it and you make it really really good and then you present it that's sort of even the 19th century idea it was a work of genius napoleon did his magic magic uh, fighting because he was a genius he he rationally thought through what he was doing scientists like newton they figured out what was going on there's obviously a disregard for newton's alchemical studies and whatnot and beethoven and all that it's like the work of genius is the articulate created work of genius and it's this unipolar vision of the mind, the rationalist 19th century. Now, of course, these guys, and Freud in particular, and Nietzsche did this quite a lot as well, and Nietzsche himself even, if you will, um, broke with this. Jung noticed this too. He looked at Nietzsche's Zarathustra and he said, you know, it's very, very strange how Nietzsche was able to allow an outside force known as Zarathustra to enter his body and possess him and speak through him. 
That's a very, very, very difficult thing for someone to do in the 19th century. Like, that's not normal. That's madness. And Nietzsche ended up going mad, which I guess is, uh, you know, you, you, you win some, you lose some in some sense. And so um, Nietzsche, Nietzsche was letting the Zarathustra inside of him, and that's like a heresy on the interface of the day or the way of seeing the world at the day. But it's actually closer to how the hardware should work. Because when you talk to a modern artist or even you, you look at something like um, how modern art works, it, it definitely looks like, um, in, in these moments of inspiration we have the, the locking of the two hemispheres together and it's almost like they start talking to each other whereas normally they're as we said inhibited and they call this hemisync and various different things but we won't get into that too much um, Freud and Jung appeared in this moment where they're trying to figure out yeah, a logic of the soul a logic of the mind a way that we can orchestrate and put together something that kind of makes sense and of course if you're going to study this stuff in any way seriously you're going to start to come across this idea of two forces and probably more but we'll just go with two for simplicity's sake. And what you start to notice very, very early on is that you'll have this rational, talking, left hemisphere ego. You know, you'll have this talking mind that the Buddhists notice. They call it the monkey mind. And it's usually delusional. It's usually a bit of a liar and usually doesn't really know what's going on. Now, we've seen this in studies with the left hemisphere. If you cut the two brains in half and have the, the right hemisphere move stuff around with the hand, the left hemisphere, even though it's, it's completely not moving what's going on, it will make up all these silly excuses and rationalizations to protect itself from the reality. It's a rationalized story maker. It's very, very fascinating in that sense. And this looks so much like the problem with the ego. The ego is like a, a god ego defense mechanism. It's, it's a bullshit. It's a bullshit basically and then there's this other force this driving force which is this unconscious this unconscious has a lot of stuff within it i can't make it simple but i'm just gonna brush over quite a lot of it but you have this force of sexual id instinctive id running up from underneath it and then you have the articulate super ego and whatnot but nonetheless it sort of boils down into this ego versus this unconscious in whatever way it manifests and so there's a great amount of tension between these two forces and so Freud, like Freud's not scientifically accurate or anything like that. He doesn't have any studies to back him up. But what he does have is he has some pretty good observations and he, he was pretty spot on. Nowadays, we say we, it's very common for us to say something like the subconscious. But that, that was sort of like one of his things to figure out. And it was sort of the part of the zeitgeist he was a part of. Now, him and Jung had a bit of a, a bickering because Jung loved all this stuff. Jung found this this other force, these these dual forces within the mind, this secret mind, the unconscious there too. He he discovered it plenty. And then when he met Freud, he was like, yo, we can we can dork out on this stuff. We can nerd out on this stuff. Fantastic. Let's go for it. Let's absolutely rock and roll. Let's have a crack at all this type of stuff. And so they start trying to figure out, well, what exactly is this these two forces now they didn't know much about the hardware but what they started to do is to try to make an interface they try to give people the language of psychoanalysis and this is why people so readily take this on as almost like a replacement religion you see it quite a lot oh uh, that's an eatable problem oh that's a neurosis oh the all these type of things we we label the thought patterns in our minds because it's an interface that we're sort of collectively constructing for the last 100 years it's a very very new thing it's a very very radical thing and a lot of people don't like it and it's understandable like it's you know these people are kind of winging it quite a lot like you shouldn't take it serious just on credit of name and stuff like this and um the the most fascinating thing for us is the reason why freud and jung broke because when freud and jung had their split that's when the red book happened okay and freud might have been suffering a little bit from that sort of 19th century problem where everything has to be reduced down to the things that we know we're not allowed to speculate really that much and so what do we know about the world well we know that like sex and urges urges instincts drive everything and so he sort of sees maybe the two forces in a very reductive sense he sort of sees the two forces as perhaps instinct and ego and maybe super ego but we'll just go for the simple one for the time being the sort of driving force the outside force of those those instinctive urges and Jung sort of saying there, there, there's a bit more to this I think that there's something the, the other force this unconscious this other magical force this other fist in this game of this this lo logic of the soul this is not something reductive like an instinct it's it's actually got an 
dare I say, an intelligence to it, a religious significance to it, you know? Things like theology, religion, high art, and beautiful emotions, big thinking and all this type of stuff. This is its essence. It has an aspect of this as well. Now, this is what I think is real. I think that's what the other forces nature is. And and Jung started to explore things like religion and um, the occult and all these weird things. And of course, Freud kind of like ditched him at that point. He was like, I, I don't really, I'm not really interested anymore. I want to stick on this grounded sexual theory because it's, you know, reductionist and simple and it kind of makes sense in this type of sense and a lot of people took Darwin serious so Freud was like well may as well stand on the back of something that's going to work now of course Jung breaks with Freud for this reason and then Jung has the blessing of getting to taste the medicine that he was trying to promote and so he goes off and he has this massive psychotic experience where the theme the main theme is that this anima shows up like this guardian angel on the shoulder and begins to talk to him and act as a psychopomp a guide to walk him into the realm the world of this other force this other side of the mind if you will this anima this other force as an almost intelligent muse comes and takes his ego and walks him into somewhere else Jung struggles immensely then with the sort of scientific worldview that he had donned. His great problem was that he had become sort of a word thinker. He'd become quite stiff in his attitude. He even says um, at, at one point that when he was younger, he saw fantasy, that part of your mind that fantasizes as a, a waste of time. He saw it as like a trivial, pointless thing. Now, his struggle then was that when all this like profound stuff happens, it sort of cuckolds that ego of his. It cuckolds that part of his mind it really kind of puts the spanner into works about the idea that the, the the word thinking mind is sufficient or sophisticated you know and there was a sort of feeling within him that he if he tried to stay within his ego it's like in a psychedelic trip if you start, try to stay within your ego and stay within your word thinking mind and um, while this overwhelming experience of the the blunt force of the unconscious comes to reach you and this anima comes up and filling you with all this bad energy and um, if you try to resist this and, and keep it within your framework you're going to get you're going to get destroyed man like it's going to break you it might send you crazy it might send you psychotic it might it might hurt you in some sense psychologically and, and so Jung sort of surrenders to this and he gives up he gives up his ability to know he gives up in the zeitgeist as he says he gives up in the sort of collective place he found himself in he gives up in this Darwinism and this Freudianism and the scientism of his day and he just goes he just goes all out he goes mask off gloves off is like all right fuck it let's go wild like let's go let's go all the way to the end and he, he starts to speak in a way that is just just you just can't talk anymore he starts to speak to his soul and this is what anima means is latin for soul he starts to speak to his soul my soul where are you do you hear me i speak i call you are you there i've returned i am here again i have shaken the dust of all the lands from my feet and i have come to you i am with you after long years of wandering i have come to you again should i tell you everything i have seen experienced and drunk in now this is very fascinating in his frame i know i'm sort of killing the magic a little bit bringing in the right hemisphere but play along with me for a bit if you think about this idea of should i tell you everything i have seen it's, it's almost like a companion yeah or maybe a companion that maybe is has, has been there for a long time but he's sort of forgotten about some type of guardian angel some type of fellow some type of uh, some type of you know partner in crime a life partner these type of things a very romantic thing and this would make a lot of sense because I guess the right hemisphere is on the other side of your head. But look, let's not go too far into that. And because what he says next is, I thought and spoke much of the soul, a soul logic lo logician, a psychologist. I thought and spoke much of the soul. I knew in any learned words uh, for her. I had judged her and turned her into a scientific object. And this is precisely what I'm trying to avoid in this whole talk because I realize this is sort of warning in that like, you know, I've turned her into a scientific object. I've turned her into a piece of hardware that you can study. But she's more than that. The anima is more than that to, to, to Carl. He takes it big serious. He does not joke around here. Now, I do believe, though, that this experience has the fingerprints of the anima, all, or of the right hemisphere all over it. I think there's something, it has to have a role here somehow. And what I think might have happened is that Jung actually broke through into a new interface. He, like, figured out, a, well, he was introduced into a new way to use the, the, the hardware that he was given. He was still 
quite unconscious of maybe the actual functioning of it. He didn't know the neuroscience of it, but he sort of got a snap about like, this is actually closer to how this stuff actually works. This is the more accurate, accurate view of this. He was getting almost like the little applications you're supposed to use. Maybe the anima is one application and then the shadow is another application. And the, if you use these, if you click these buttons properly, then you'll use the hardware very, very well. Now it's a very interesting way of thinking. Um, because when you actually look at more, you go into more detail about this right hemisphere, you start to see more stuff that suits this. But of course, it's not quite as straightforward as you just have like these two blobs of hardware, these two magic pieces of jelly, and, and that's how it works. Like the brain is quite a complex system. There's an underbrain as well, if you want, a lower brain, and then there's like all this stuff going on. But but obviously these two big lumps of jelly have a massive, massive inf influence on how it works. Now one of the most interesting ways to get the sort of comprehensive view of this is to look at dreams and dreams are very significant for this because Jung started to speak about his soul and where to find her is that you find her in the dregs of my thought my dreams and my fantasies the one thing that he had dismissed and perhaps ignored in back in his day he now realized that that was there was during his moments of fantasizing and dreaming there was something speaking to him now, something that I came across earlier in my life when I was getting into all this stuff is how do dreams work? It's a very, very complicated process. And an idea that I always thought was quite interesting is that dreams are actually a very, very raw model of the order of thinking. And what does that mean? Remember that 19th century idea where you had, you know, Napoleon or Beethoven, the genius, and he'd invent the, the, the great work. Nietzsche would sit down and plan out Zarathustra which in practical experience always turns out to be writer's block. You're trying to perfect what you're doing and you end up overthinking and you kill off the creativity and you become sterile. Whereas the great artists often talk about surrendering and something coming over them, a muse appearing, and Michelangelo saying, I see an angel trapped in the stone that I have to free. There's no, it's not like, hey, I'm going to uh, measure out all the connotations, the contours of all this type of stuff, and none of that stuff. And so the, the model in that way of thinking, that perfectionist wrong way of thinking, I'd say, is that, yeah, like it's, it's a sort of um, thought originates in the rational procedural mind and whatnot. But of course, it's well known that like our subconscious drives a lot of our decisions, as they often say nowadays. And even when you look at dreams, dreams start to take on that appearance. There's this weird unconscious to more conscious process like a funnel if you will and um, down in the bottom of your brain you get you get this rem sleep is triggered by like the very very ancient parts of it and it's really really like you know grounded in the body impulse experience the sparking of the bottom brain now, you might remember Jordan Peterson mentioning that uh, one thing, one hypothesis that people have proposed, and there is evidence for this, pretty decent evidence for this, is that um, when you're having a dream, what's happening is the right hemisphere is, is like talking to the left hemisphere in crazy symbol language. Because the right hemisphere doesn't actually have words. It doesn't have a Broca's area. You have a Broca's area on your left side. You get hit by a pipe there. You won't be able to talk anymore. You get hit by the pipe on the other side and you probably will be fine. You might have a headache though, which probably will be fine. <laughs> Okay, and so the, the right brain doesn't have an ability to talk. It's quite, quite weird, but it can communicate. Now, there's a difference. It can't use speech, but it can communicate. And the way it communicates is sort of like it, it like paints pictures, if you will. So it's like it's like that friend of yours, you know, who sits in the corner and doesn't talk and then like flashes you pictures of stuff to try to communicate its feelings. Imagine how, imagine how weird your experience was if I said to you, you can't use words. You can only like paint and stuff. You can only use like, I don't know, hand movement and gesture and whatnot. And you you turn into quite a funky person to be around. And sort of what the right hemisphere's problem is, it's like, I'm such a damn genius. I know so much stuff. I'm just fecking Egypt over on the other side of the head, across the hall. <sighs> he, like, he just wants words. He doesn't understand my, 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 my interpretive dance that I'm doing. <laughs> so that's its challenge. It's always trying to speak in a more um, symbolic language, if you will, a more imagistic way. And that's exactly what dreams appear like, aren't they? Like when you think about it, it's almost like, you know, your left hemisphere, your little ego there goes to sleep and it's like, all right, sweet, nice one. I'll, I'll tip down and then knock on the door. And it's like, what the fuck is, is that? Oh, it's the right brain again. And it's just like, you know, a, a cat wearing pants and stuff. And you're like, what are you talking about? You're so strange. Why do you always show up at night when I'm trying to go to sleep? Like, who the fuck are you? What are you doing? What are you trying to tell me? Like, this is just like, make more sense. What are you doing? And then it does all this like crazy stuff. And it takes you to the astral plane and stuff like this and talks to you about, it says like, boy, is the meaning of the universe. And you're like, what are you talking about? This is, this is insane. Leave me alone. 
Um, but this is the sort of dynamic, it seems, because when you wake up um, and the dream goes away and you recall the dream, it, it unlocks from a part of your right hemisphere. So there's like, you know, it's stored in the other side. And so it's almost like the, the, the dream is, uh, well, at least it's coming out of that and to, to propose then that maybe that's where it, it's sourced from. It's sourced from that type of thing. So it's like the right hemisphere updating the left hemisphere. So you can imagine, if you want, that it sits on your shoulder, like I said earlier, and you go out and you do all your return to monkey mission plans and whatnot, and it's just watching on your shoulder. And it's like, fucking blogger. And it's taking down notes about these are the things I have to say. And maybe it's drawing pictures and preparing. And then when you go down to sleep, it starts to send in the updates. You know, in a way, like your computer re restarts and whatnot. And it's like blasting in those updates over to the other side, freaking you out. And you're like, <laughs> what am I, why, is, why are all my dreams criticizing me with these really, really weird symbols, making fun of me and whatnot? So it has a blast. It has a blast, like teasing you and whatnot. And this is this is the sort of order and hierarchy of, of thinking in your mind. There's almost this fertile and creative imagistic mind that, that blasts you with information and you in some sense have to listen to it. It's, you're supposed to process that and, and, and take that in and, and, and orientate that in some sense. Okay? Um, now, that's a weird way of thinking, but it actually looks quite, a, quite close to, for example, a successful artist. A successful artist will have and be able to connect with this part of themselves that starts to just flood the ideas and they feel like they're almost like getting out of the way of the sh the, 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 the funnel, the fuel, the, the power force of, of the imagistic imagination shooting forward and it's almost like all they really do is craft and shape what's coming out. They're not the source. The source comes from somewhere else. And then, of course, even deeper down, you have this like big impulsive elect electric power coming from the deep body, the, the strong beating heart and whatnot. And so it gives us this model of the mind almost as if like instinct and urge, you know, that shoots up into the right hemisphere and then the right hemisphere chews that up and understands that and then shoots it over to the left hemisphere as like an order or a command or a feeling perhaps or something like this. Now, I don't want to jump to massive conclusions and say, oh, it, this is completely how it works, but there's something to this way of thinking about it. There's some type of hierarchy here. The left hemisphere is actually, the, the ego the, is, is a lot more uh, designed to listen and take orders, whereas the right hemisphere is a lot more designed to maybe interpret and give orders. And, and it does it in this emotional, symbolic way. And then the body is a lot more inclined to just sit there and whine and complain and be like, oh, food, <laughs> stuff like this. Now, this has an interesting connotation. So a suggestion I'm going to propose to you is that this right hemisphere's job is sort of like a secretary, sort of like a, a mediator between you and the world and the real world. And it has a sort of personality and it talks to the ego, which is, I'm going to say, the left hemisphere. And this is like, I know, speculating, but we've got to try play around here to see how well we can sort of sort out an interface. Um, and and this, this guardian, this secretary sits on the shoulder and mediates between you and two men main things okay the outside world and the inside world because of course you've got all these impulses that rush up in this crazy way and these passions and whatnot and it's silly to say perhaps the right hemisphere is the source of this but she's almost working with you in order to process what's going on with these emotions it seems like it comes up into her first and it lands on her desk first and she decides actually more like a, an executive a ceo she decides what this means and then she delegates the task over to the left hemisphere and tells it what to do remember i was saying to you go towards the tree and then the right hemisphere it sees the bear and it will leave you alone but when it sees the bear and it feels that fear and it understands all right this is what's going on it will try grab the left hemisphere and change its frame it's like the leader it's like the leader has no hands it has to send you around in some sense and so the right hemisphere sort of has this like guardian leadership quality of some sort like athena grabbing achilles hair and pulling it around and it's it's got this ability to do a lot of different things it has a lot of different um faces it can it can show and it introduces you to powers and it's not like it's necessarily the source of these powers but it introduces you you know to great passions or profound inspiration or maybe big g himself for all we know we don't we don't know how this stuff works or powers out in the world it, it, it she has this interactive mediating mediating psychopomp role here sitting on the right side of your head now this is very confusing and very very strange and it, it puts a sort of autonomy and and, and roll to this right hemisphere that it's like that is that a bit much of a stretch and it's certainly speculative but think about this there's actually decent enough evidence that the right hemisphere has this ability to command you to do stuff 
to command you to do stuff. It's able to talk to you and say to you stuff like, do this, do that. It's able to push you in that type of way. Now, it's even able to do that in a vocal sense. It's even able to speak, okay? Now, the person who hypothesized this first was a gentleman called Julian Jaynes. And he came up with a really radical idea that, for example, stuff like the Bible um, and God, you know, the way God speaks and God speaks in this very blunt, commanding way. This commanding voice of God was the right hemisphere speaking to the left hemisphere. And quite heretical, quite a, quite a, you know, we'll get you in a lot of trouble, but just entertain it for the sake of the argument for the time being. Maybe we'll say it was mediating God's voice. That's perfectly possible as well. Just like you think about the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? It comes down and enters your body, takes control of you, and mediates God's intention and will to you. It's the mediator, interesting enough. Now, um, Julian James hypothesized that the, the right brain was able to do this. The right brain was able to talk to you. And so, you know, the phenomenon, the scary one that we consider a mental illness where you hear voices. Well, it's like, oh, well, yeah, that's a bad thing. If that's happening, the hardware is broken, obviously. OK. And Julian James suggested, no, that's actually normal functioning of the heart. Well, maybe not normal, but that, that's the hardware can do that. And it's not a signal that it's broken. It's a signal that the hardware is sort of doing its job in a very uncomfortable and annoying way. And the people in the past who had this interface of the gods were, were perfectly able to understand this. Like the people in the past were very able to just listen to what God said. God wills it. You know, God told me to do this. And you, you know the sort of atheist argument now? It's like, oh, they did all this terrible stuff because God told them to do it. And it's like back then that you would have said it to them. It's like, oh, God, God told you to like take over Jericho? It's like, yes. <laughs> It's yes, JPEG. Yes. Yes, he did. And and I I will do it because it's God. You fucking idiot. Like, I'm not going to say no to him. It's God. He's like speaking in my mind. Are you serious? And it's like, oh, you're crazy. It's like you, you're fat, overweight and you got diabetes. Shut up. Like, I'm, I'm the king of like an entire like land. Like, what are you talking about? And so Julian James proposes that this 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 right hemisphere can command the left hemisphere and sometimes even speak as a hallucinated voice in the head. He says that language, the speech areas, evolved in the left hemisphere in right-handed people, which, as James underlined, is a mystery since most human structures are bilateral and a neurological necessity for so so most human structures, you know, appear you can have two hands. You'd imagine you have two speech centers, but there's only on one side. But um, what they've noticed is that there's a neurological organization necessary for language that also exists in the right hemisphere, but with no observable function. So, weird thought, over on the other side of the noggin, even though you don't use it, there's a thing there, a big lump of hardware that could speak if it wanted to. It could have a voice if it wanted to. It just sort of doesn't do anything. Interesting. Now, James proposed that the bicameral mind in man operated between 10,000 BC and 1,000 BC, BC was um, the left hemisphere was the site of articulate, conscious, egotistical speech, and the right hemisphere was for hallucinations, which expressed the voices and commands of gods and demons. Fucking crazy thought. And a lot of people said, ah, no, too far, bro. There's no evidence for that. There's no evidence for that at all. And of course, since then, what we've got is something called an EEG, the ability to scan the brain. So we found out a lot of this stuff about left hemisphere, right hemisphere. And what they have done, here's a study, they neuroimaged, um, the neuroimaging techniques of today have illuminated and confirmed the importance of Jane's hypothesis. Belinda Lennox and colleagues used spatial and temporal mapping of neural activity in a right-handed schizophrenic patient to show that his auditory hallucinations occurred in various parts of his right hemisphere, but not in his left, which could explain why the activations are misinterpreted as alien. That's pretty fucking crazy. So these people have this, what we consider the mental illness, the really difficult to explain mental illness. They, they study some of them. Maybe it's not the case for all, so we're jumping to conclusions here, but hey, we're trying to have a bit of fun. And it seems like, you know, the voice in the head, the commands are the right hemisphere turned on and starting to talk. And it's like, wh why is it doing that? What the fuck is going on? And, you know, the, the reality here is that just no one has any good answers. And the problem might be the way we're looking at it. The problem might be that we think we have to obsess about the hardware when really we want to start obsessing about the interface. We want to start obsessing about how we present this stuff to people. What's really going on here? Now, again, another big speculation I'm making, and just to reiterate, is that perhaps this right hemisphere has some type of mediating role between you and all the other forces that maybe exist inside the mind. Maybe that's its job. I'm not too sure. And actually, our challenge is that I think young 
was baptized into this very, very close to the truth perspective and seeing things. When he had that massive break and had this anima and all that, he was getting like a really raw experience of the hardware doing what it can do. And it overwhelmed him and blew him up. And then he tried to put together this sort of compendium of knowledge that described what happened to him. And so he comes up with the anima and the shadow and the unconscious and the collective unconscious and all this type of stuff. And it's like an interface. That's sort of what he's building. He's building an interface. He built an interface. And a lot of people take it on. Now, the problem is that it's it, it, it turns religious instantly because it's it's literally in a replacement for religion. A lot of people don't like that about the cult-like qualities of, of Jungians and whatnot. And it's fair enough. And it's it's also it doesn't have any connection to the hardware. And so a lot of people don't take it serious scientifically because there's no evidence for it. And and but but you can see sort of what's going on. In fact, the words that came to him were um the anima said to him, I'm here to reveal to you the new religion. And, you know, that's the kind of point when you hear a voice in your head that comes and says, I'm here to teach you a new religion. You're kind of like, I'm done. I'm out. It's just send me to the asylum. I'm finished. I'm crazy. Yeah, you got me. All right, God. All right. All right. All right. But maybe maybe there's sort of something to it. Maybe we could swap out religion for interface. You know, we could swap that out a little bit and think about it and really, really think about it. Like Jung got offered this idea of the guardian angel, Holy Spirit mediator, you know, and he had no understanding of the hardware. And so it kind of doesn't land properly. It feels a bit cultish. It feels a bit off. It feels a bit irky. And the people who attach to his knowledge almost always turn into jargonites and don't actually manifest what he's talking about. And um, yeah, it just doesn't quite click. It doesn't quite click. But there's something to it. it. It it doesn't captivate people's minds for no reason. And he definitely got a lot of things correct. And when we start to model this, and again, we have to break up a lot of Jung's ideas here. And again, this gets everybody mad. But when we model this to the hardware, what we know about the hardware, because we know a lot more about the hardware now than we did, it, it fits in some ways. Some of it starts to kind of click together. And the kind of challenge that I would offer to people um, is you, what we probably need to do with the meaning and all this type of crap. What we need to do is we need to start looking at this idea that we have the hardware and we have to avoid getting too like left-brained about the hardware and thinking that it's like you just got to figure out the hardware and not like, explain everything away. But you also got to um, understand that you need an interface but then we've also finally got to understand that in order to satisfy the collective mind, we do actually need an explanation of the hardware that marries with an explanation of the interface. I believe the reason why Jordan Peterson probably did so well is because he was probably the closest attempt to do something like that. He really, really gave it a whack. And he, of course, was very inspired by Jung, you know. And that's a fascinating thing because I think people are desperately waiting for this because Jung was desperately trying to figure out what to do about the death of God as everybody else was. And in some sense, the death of God is the death of of the interface, the, the problem of the dying interface. What do you do? What to do in the situation of the interface? So this dynamic is vitally important. And so the last dynamic to this, and another thing to add to the picture, and again, what I'm sort of actively proposing here is this, this is a problem that I don't have the answers to, but I do think that I'm actually articulating a clear place that we need to start looking and a way that we need to start looking at it that um, I haven't seen before. Genius Boyle, Guru Boyle, you know, I haven't seen it before. And so maybe it's something that we can kind of chew on a little bit and look forward to. But of course, the the problem is the pragmatism. Like a lot of people, you know, you're like, all right, Steph, I have a place inside the right side of my head that could start to give me schizophrenic delusions. Thank you. Great video. Really changed my life. <laughs> really, really helpful. Really helpful. Like, how is this stuff practical? And so Jung was a lot better at this. Jung had like a, a decent and um, romantic interface and he had like a lot of practical ideas with it and whatnot. And so I actually want to talk to you a little bit about um, anima projection and how it relates to all these type of ideas. And it's um, I'm going to show you a, a gentleman who actually talks about it in, in one of the most clear ways I've ever seen. It. And he talks about it in the context of relationships. Well, the first thing that you can do in order to take some of the charge out of this and to wake up is to distinguish between what is real and what isn't. Okay, facts versus stories. What are the facts about this person and what are the stories that you've made up or projected onto them that simply aren't real? Okay, I remember when I was younger in school, I'd have these crazy crushes on different girls that were in my class or in other classes where let's just say we would, you know, cross paths in a hallway and just lock eyes for a second. And here's what would happen. Okay, this is how the virus of one-itis hijacks your mind. We'd cross paths, lock eyes for a brief second, and this is what the virus would say. Did you see that, Julian? You locked eyes. That was a little longer than the usual eye lock. 
which rarely happens, let's be honest, you know what? That might be your special one. Really? My special one? Yes. You know those movies you watched with the soulmate? Seems based upon that eye-locking instance that that might be your soulmate. Really? I guess so, you know. And then what would happen? Your mind's hijacked and I would start painting out the entire picture of what our lives would be like together. You know what? You're right, <laughs> one itis virus. That is the one. You know what? I never thought of it, but it would be so great to be with that person, to date that person. This is what it would feel like. This is what my friends would think. Oh, they would all be so impressed. What would her friends think? Oh, where would our first date be? And then we'd get married and what are our kids gonna be like? How many kids are we gonna have? And literally our entire lives together painted in my mind and I would just loop and think about this person every single day. I'd listen to emo music right at night, like doo -doo -doo, there's a guy and a girl, doo -doo -doo, and I'd be like, that's the one. Just think about her. Oh yes, I do miss her. Oh, she is my purpose. And I would just loop and loop every movie that I'd watch. Oh, they fell in love. I understand what it's like because I also have that with this person where we locked eyes. Okay. Now, if you take this and you would talk to me back then, you're like, so, uh, you know, how's your love life? Oh, well, there's this person. I would tell you everything about them. You know, we have so much in common, shared values, et cetera, et cetera. Yet, if you sat me down and you're like, Julian, let's be honest here. What are the facts? What are the stories? And there's like two columns and I have to write it down. Facts are this. We spent, you know, one second locking eyes in a hallway at school. That's it. What are the stories? Years and years of just made up stories and projections onto that person. Okay. The real life facts was a second stories, years of what our lives would be like together. And just this seen it like that. Okay, and I'd recommend you do the same around this person. Just write down the facts, the stories. You will be shocked by how this monitus virus will skew your reality to the point where you're living in this fantasy land. You've hypnotized yourself in this fantasy land. So Julian here uses some very interesting words, hypnotic and projection, really speaking to us about the psychology of this dynamic. Now, what seems to be happening here is, of course, you have this guardian on your shoulder. She's like the CEO of the of the, the, the mind, and she's taken in all this information from the passions, from the body, from the urges, from the instinct, from the outside world, all this chaos, doing what a good guardian on the shoulder would do. And she's trying to vaguely figure out what we've got to do in order to, to be effective in this world. She's thinking to herself, you know, this, this guardian, this anima on your shoulder she's thinking to herself right well we've got to tell this ego over here on the other side this plonker and um, what what to aim for to what to ignore and what to aim for what what frame and perspective i need to choose what direction i need to kind of push him in i need to motivate him to go for this type of thing and so on her desk sitting down there is athena you know with her plan her strategy on her desk she's got certain life goals as we all do and nature sort of fills you up with juice and says you know try to get the whole wife and kids thing but just at the very least just get a girl like, you know and just get something done like just try try get a baby out somehow you know this type of thing so you're on on this list on her list of archetypes if you will she sort of has like all right uh romance and get the girl that's the first thing then maybe like get a house and marriage and all that stuff later but for now just like step one get the damn girl all right whatever that is just figure out a girl get her and we can kind of plan from there and so she's looking for an archetype. She's looking for the feminine. She's looking for the feminine and she wants to invoke the archetype of Romeo and Juliet. She wants to get that going. So she's sitting there on the shoulder and she's scanning like the way you're, you're, she scans all day and then when you go to sleep at night she starts to speak to you with her crazy artistic dream language. She's sitting there and she's scanning. And this chick, this lady, this this young, long, young little feminine girl, she walks in um, and and the she suits, she suits the bill, she fits the bill, she fits the archetype obviously and um, she's not like perfect archetype but she's close enough and so the 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 soul the anima the, the the right hemisphere athena with her plan she sees this and so she decides all right well that's that that'll do she's close enough and um, so what i'm going to do is i'm going to fill her with attractive psychic energy 
I'm going to fill her with magic and Young called this mana. The anima has this ability to shoot and project mana out into the world. And it's like a little carrot on the stick. So she she shoots that energy into this person, like the archetypal energy of lust and love and passion. And then the, the ego is like drawn towards it. And it's like, okay, that's what I'm going to go for. And then the dopamine spirals kick in the gear and you start to tell yourself all this nonsense and you, you try to make it happen or maybe you don't try to make it happen. You just think about it, whatever. And so that's the, the sort of very, very intelligent way. It's not like this commanding mode, which we saw maybe in the schizophrenics, where it, like the, the right hemisphere, the, 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 the other side, the, the guardian angel just turns around and speaks as another voice, get the girl. Like it's not, it's not like that at all. Instead, it's, it's, um, you're, you're drawn, you're intoxicated, you're coaxed, you're, as I said, carrot is dangled above the head. You could think of it actually like Cupid. Cupid pulls open the arrow and shoots it, and it hits this girl, and it hits you. And then suddenly you're just filled with this intoxicating problem. You're, you're caught in a magic spell, and you're going to have to chase after this person. Now, this might be animate projection. This might be you shooting out into the world in order to get something. It's the instincts operating through you. It's the brain doing its job in order to get you to enjoy the passions of the instincts. And I don't mean to be reductive because the real experience is far more beautiful than the hardware description of what's going on. But maybe maybe this is the how the hardware is working. Now, this is generally good. It generally gets us to the end goal, which is, you know, marriage and mating and whatnot. But we also have to ask ourselves what Jung meant by animate integration. Now, what you'll learn off someone like Julian is that oftentimes this this fantasizing is a load of crap. It's kind of delusional. And oftentimes what this turns you into is not actually a very compelling character for the poor young lady. So she's going about her day and then some like creepy dude like, you know, runs up and grabs her sleeve and says, you're perfect. You're the perfect archetype and fulfillment of my life. I need you. I need you. I need you. Please, please let me fall in love with you. And she feels this desperate, needy energy clinging onto her. And it's like, oh my fuck, what the fuck is that? Oh my God, get away from me, man. Jeez, blah, that type of thing. And and this makes it worse because then he's like, oh my God, she's playing hard to get. <laughs> And, and so she's she's blah, she doesn't want that at all she, she's not like that at all and of course it's not healthy as well because then you get her and then the second you get her she's like she's perfect I have her it's amazing and then what will happen is the fantasy will die once the anima is like ticking the box and said right we've got the girl that's good um, so what next what's going to fulfill me next you know, what's the, we, we're, we're unsure, are we going to survive into the future? Uh, is death going to conquer us? Um, what, what's next? And obviously nothing fills up the, the thing. So it's like, oh my God, it, the, the fantasy dies. You realize what's going on and you, 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 you crumble and you die or some sort. Or maybe the fantasy stays on and it's, it's delusional. Nonetheless, the fantasy is not perfectly ideal. There's a higher operant way of doing this. And so what Julian often says is that you need to go inside yourself and find a sort of completion experience inside yourself. You need to find something in yourself that makes you comfortable with yourself, that makes you able to be alone for the rest of your life, that would make you able to be intoxicated with yourself and find meaning in yourself and find all these good things in yourself. Now, it all sounds very, very trite, but when you think about it, it actually makes sort of logical sense. You know, if you're out there trying to get something off her, that makes you scary to her, makes you weird, it makes you needy. But if you're out there and you discover in yourself some some type of magic spark, some type of magic colourful power that gives you this ability to assert your will on the world, you become very, very masculine. In fact, you might even become very, very attractive. And then you show up in her reality as this force that's driving towards, that's giving out energy, giving out juice. And then she sort of sees this and she's like, wow, there's a guy who's got it going on and he's not... He's not he's not not demanding anything of me. He doesn't he doesn't have that weird feeling that all the other dudes do or I'm like the completion of him. If he he has some type of magnetic energy of some sort that I'm really really drawn to. Now, Jung ends up going along and saying some very, very interesting things in the Red Book, such as, I shall learn that my soul finally lies behind everything. And if I cross the world, I am ultimately doing this to find my soul. I must learn that the dregs of my thought, my dreams are the speech of my soul. And how could I fear solitude when I can indulge in the joys of my soul? When I desire outwardly, seeking things in my desire, I am soulless, I am empty. But when I dive within and figure out my emotions, I learn to listen to her. I realize what she actually wants. And then the fulfillment comes from here. Now that's very much along these lines. This idea that you, there's this empty feeling and the animus sitting there on the on the shoulder and she's trying to just get you to the, she's just trying to get you to procreate she's trying to do life's work she's kind of a little bit stressed out Athena the CEO trying to tick off the thing so she shoots you out there and she's there helping you the whole time and you ignore her you're this stupid little left brain who ignores her you're this little ego who ignores her 
But what happens if you could listen to her? What happens if you could meet her? Imagine if you could pause for a moment and it's almost like a meditation. Spend a bit of time with yourself and look inside. Look inside your mind, inside your psyche. And, and you can actually realize there's a lot more going on than just, you know, your jibber-jabbering left hemisphere, your little ego there blathering on, your linguistic mind. In fact, you know, dreams, they come from outside. And you, you kind of ask yourself, it's like, where do those dreams come from? Those emotions come from underneath. Where do they come from? And this regulating force, perhaps, the, that, that is sort of organizing them, this strange Athena, Athena the CEO sitting there on the shoulder. She's she's sort of operating as some type of intelligent force. And if you could dive in and, and contact all this and kind of say to yourself, wait a second, what, what, this imagination that I have, this, this thing that's filling me with this energy, this fantasy, delusional capacity I have to, to, to obsess about this girl, what, what, where, what's that coming from? What, what does that want? What's its plans? And then Athena might, you know, show you her plan. She might say to you, it's like, yeah, I'm, well, she, maybe she won't say, she'd do her weird dream language or whatever, but you could assume maybe that she's sort of saying, yeah, I, I want to get all these archetypes in order. I'm just trying to get us through to the end of the life, you know, I just want you to have a good life and whatnot. So, what I've done is I've sort of like set out a bit of a plan and you could maybe sit down with her and, and talk to her about her plan and you could say yeah you know maybe the girl would be great and it would be like fulfillment and it'd achieve sexual fulfillment and then it'd have like a baby and then that would be like DNA passed on and then that's a win but maybe you could sort of talk to her a little bit and say well what's like you know is there is there anything beyond that is there, an, is there any higher goals is there anything that takes things higher and higher and higher at all and she might say well marriage is like the next step up from that and then it even becomes the idea of stuff like really really profound ideas like well, what would be worth dying for? It's almost like a spiritual question. You know, she starts to turn into that muse. What would be worth dying for? What would be worth having a great, great purpose? What about these type of things? This this idea, instead of fantasizing about the girl, what if you fantasized about really, really big ideas? Ideas that would justify war and justify fighting and justify struggle and whatnot. What if we really, really got there where that would justify the challenge life goes through, which is to live is to suffer? And to, to survive is to find the meaning in the suffering. What would that be like? How would that appear to you? How would that appear to us? And maybe you would start to learn that, that she's able to show you this. This propensity towards imagination and fantasizing is actually a really, really powerful thing. And of course, this idea of dreaming, you know, she's the sort of dream master. And if you work with her and develop a relationship with her, she can actually give you this ability to dream. And this is quite an interesting thing because think about it in the sort of like self-help follow your dream type thing. If you actually really, really think about that, that's one of the most powerful assets you can have, especially as a man, because that's what a leader is. A leader is someone with vision. A leader is someone who's able to organize everything, organize the, the, the chaos of a team, organize all the different personalities and shoot them towards one vision. He's able to op offer a vision to everybody. He's able to stand there and say, this is the direction that I'm going. This is the direction that we all can go. This is where, what I'm shooting towards and I'll go first towards this vision and this will pull us all along. Now, what's fascinating about that is that when you achieve that, what you could kind of have to do is get your imagination and allow it to flower out and shoot out in that direction and chase towards the future. But this is not easy to do for people. You see, in order to dream, you have to have bravery. Most people don't let themselves dream. They don't let themselves vision. They don't let themselves imagine. And they don't let themselves feel. Everybody is afraid of feeling their emotions because most emotions are very, very negative or they have a tense aspect to them. They make us discontent. They make us feel bad. We don't want to have a relationship with them. We want to get stuck in our head and stick with our nice egotistical plan and hold ourselves in there and our little personality and whatnot. And then we want to push all that stuff down. We don't want to dream because dreams put pressure on us. If we are going to dream big about you know, taking over the world and we don't achieve it, that means we're a failure and a loser and that hurts. And so instead we'll settle for less, we'll become mediocre in some sense. And of course, when we make this bubble of comfort where we become mediocre, what happens is you're still discontent. You're never going to be fulfilled because you'll just be empty. You'll be consuming crap. You'll be there consuming, watching soy flicks and all this type of stuff, consuming with this empty comfort zone that you're after building for yourself. And what you'll start to do, you'll start to go on OnlyFans. You'll start to go on OnlyFans and you'll start to try suckle in the anima mana energy. This idea that these fantasizing girls that you can obsess about will fulfill you in some type of sense. But of course, if you broke past all that delusion, all that Oedipal problem, and you went inside yourself and you confronted your passions, and like Nietzsche says, you wrestled them into order. You took the chaos of your passions and you understood them and you worked with them and you, you, you firmly put them all together towards one organizing idea that would elight your imagination and then the guardian Cupid Athena on 
on your shoulder would spark you and start to fill you full of the dream energy and suddenly like the two hemispheres lock together and give you this ability to see see in a way that people usually can't do and you assert to yourself a future and you then go and try to achieve that future what you start to achieve is something quite profound you have something that most people don't you have drive and you have vision Arnold Schwarzenegger said that even though he definitely had a lot of willpower it was his vision that created his will he used to imagine himself as like you know the masculine Superman body that he had and that would always motivate him to go because he, he believed that it was possible he could see that it was possible now this is quite interesting because fantasy and delusion it's often seen as like nonsense it's often seen as like um, feminine you know oh like childish feminine crap you know you're like oh talking about all your dreams and all that you want to be like realistic you know that's really really how things should be going and of course there's something to that you do need realism but nonetheless it's this permission to allow yourself to dream it actually requires bravery bravery to think in some sense and then when you have this childlike massive vision and then backed up with the masculine virtues of courage in order to face these visions you achieve something which is in, like probably the highest archetype of masculinity the archetype of the leader the visionary leader not the kind of stiff strong man not the kind of guy who asserts himself and thinks he knows everything in that type of sense but the guy who asserts himself almost in a in a in a in the, the highest human form of this the 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 highest spiritual form of this someone who has a purpose someone who sees how things should go people like Julius Caesar you know a dangerous dangerous warrior a leader of an army but nonetheless someone with vision that's what made him that leader and you have someone like Elon Musk like he's sort of a poor speaker and kind of sloppy with the way he organizes himself and and not really like an articulate communicator in that type of sense but he's someone that everybody wants to work for everybody wants to go and interact with him because his, he has this delusional big thinking perspective he has vision he has this incredible shot forward and whatnot and someone like someone like Napoleon is quite in the same sense you know Napoleon a short dude he um not the most manly dude you'll ever you'll ever meet and whatnot, but he's an effective man of action, has this vision, this massive vision of taking over the world. Same with Nietzsche, you know, an incel clinging to the side of a mountain. And that, that's up there. He's definitely not the most Chad dude ever, but he has vision. He has vision in a way that most people can't have. He has the bravery to assert the craziest thoughts, especially for his zeitgeist and his era. It's incredible. It's intoxicating. It's what we value at the highest apex of masculine energy. It's the true visionary, the true genius. That's what we're always searching for and of course if you can find this in yourself you develop this it's almost like you take that right hemisphere's power of projecting this magic and organ and dangling carrots in front of you and it becomes part of you and then suddenly you become magic you become incredible you become magnetic you have this sort of energy about you Elon Musk walks into the room and everybody's like what is he going to say what is he going to do that's the guy with the plan you know and then girls when they're around that type of energy it's incredibly intoxicating because it's like oh my god there's someone who's got this firm you know you think about masculine energy a firm hard direction that they're pushing towards it's assertive it's it's ballsy it's courageous it's shooting for something but it's also joyful and fun and energetic and, a, and, and not this kind of uh, fox masculinity to draw from here it's like I'm going to be a tough guy and I'm going to sit there and be all bitter and pessimistic and all this this is someone who's been broken by life this is not someone who's rediscovered the soul of a child within them and overcome the scarcity and difficulty for life and the assertion from all these dudes is that this is how you flip this script you flip this problem where you're 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 projecting and fantasizing about a girl and becoming a creep that needs her that scares her off and instead you go and you look into that empty soul and you awaken the spark within it you achieve the ability to become a visionary and you shoot for your goal organize your passions and then she becomes like a a moon oscillating around your firm orbit that you're 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 shooting towards now this is what looks like anima integration is and I warn all boyos who are listening to this the problem I see with this concept that is so dangerous with this interface that is so dangerous is most guys don't possess the foundational virtue which is the ability to be brave to face their emotions to face fear in the real world and to be sincere with themselves about what they actually want and so what happens is they have this problem where they're still stuck in their head they're still stuck in their left hemispheric jargonizing stuff and what they do is they read young they read young and they find this concept of the anima and 
they replace it for their effeminate feelings because their feelings are all premised on being uninitiated, being scared, being scared of facing the truth reality in themselves. And so what happens is they sort of, you know, they feel moody about something. They say, oh, it's my anima. They feel bad about something and it's, oh, it's my anima. And, you know, maybe, maybe technically it's kind of close to it, but nonetheless, it's not effective. They're just sort of developing cult-like behaviors to explain away their, their cowardness. And that's really what you want to try crush out of yourself. Fundamentally, someone with zest and juice is shooting towards something. Someone who finds this stuff within themselves, it's premised on the virtue to have the bravery to discover this stuff. It's all about bravery fundamentally. That is the great, great challenge because the anima is a woman. The, the right hemisphere, the, the she, the guardian angel, she is a woman. And Nietzsche said, careless, mocking, forceful. That's how wisdom wants us because she is a woman and saves herself only for the love of a warrior. And so in summary, this concept, the anima, that Jung was experiencing, not as a concept, but as a real thing in his Red Book, is almost like Jung was baptized into an ancient way of experiencing yourself in the world. A really, really old way that is not possible for us to digest these days. And it is a huge credit to Jung that he was able to make it through this experience without snapping because it's, you know, it's a psychotic experience. It's very, very difficult to go through. Nonetheless, it's an amazing thing to look at. Now, our challenge, of course, is that we're burdened by our inquiring mind to have to know explicitly how the hardware works and all that type of stuff, and it sort of sterilizes the romanticism. But it does put a, a reasonable pressure on a lot of the, the inventing um, interfaces and words and sort of just organizing your mind with like all these strange words without ever going through the actual experience in some sense. And in many ways, our age really suffers from a left hemisphere Ferritism, uh, quite a lot and I think a great project going forward and something that I'm often thinking about and talking to people about is like oh well how do you bridge this very very difficult gr uh, gap how do you create something that is true to the hardware and uses the hardware well but is also uh, elegant and intuitive and representational and not larpy and weird so it's a difficult problem nonetheless. Now, obviously, the most practical thing, as I said at the end, is that you want to be able to actually know when this stuff is happening to you. That's probably the way that it's, it, will, it will really change your life and transform your life. And there is nothing more transformative than reclaiming your visionary power that has been in, projected out into the world and is leading you like a dangling carrot into silly, silly behaviors where you're creeping girls out. Instead, your ability to grab that and pull it within and understand understand yourself and understand where it comes from yourself and reclaim that force inside your head that guardian angel get her marry with her make her happy make it a good house inside here and then take that power and shoot it out into the world as a visionary explosive energy that relights the world and makes the world dance again that reanimates the world is giving the world its soul back that's fundamentally our challenge you hear people talk about meaning crises and all this crap they don't it's just it's just shuffling jargon around in a bookshelf inside their left hemisphere. They don't know what they're doing. They're not very good at what they're doing as well. What you're looking for, what the world wants is you to discover the fire in your soul and the visionary imagination that is your soul. And it wants you to, to claim that within yourself and have it explode out of you like a shining star. And that is your one victory and your one path. So if you want to talk to me, I can work with you in this precise thing. I can teach you many, many arrays of skills and whatnot. And so as always, there is a free call down below you can have a chat with me or a member of my boyo squadron and you will you, we will talk together about doing one-on-one -on -one work with me or you can come on my mentorship program and we have many many courses and programs i've been preparing in the shadows of boyo land over here so thank you very much for your time as always people i look forward to talking to you soon i hope the juice may the juice be with you we got to keep our cultness up here may the juice be with you boyo over and out bye-bye